Hey, it's Vass here from Aussie RC Playground and welcome to my review of the Armour Creighton 6S BLX V4. So this is a 1.8 scale four wheel drive brushless monster truck. It's equipped with a 4074 2050 kV brushless motor paired up to 150 amp ESC capable of running up to 6S. It has a waterproof steering servo up the front measuring in at 15 kilograms of torque. And of course, it comes equipped with a uh, STX2 Spectrum radio. Now this is the fourth incarnation of this vehicle. And if you wanna know more about this particular truck, if you're new to the brand or new to the channel, please be sure to check out the video description. I'll have links in there to the Armour website as well as a playlist to all the previous Armour vehicles that I've unboxed and reviewed here on the channel, just so that you're a little bit more up to speed. Now, normally with my reviews, we go through seven categories. I give you a score out of five for each category and then tally it up in the end and give you a total score of the vehicle, which pretty much summarizes my overall view of it. Today, we're actually gonna be flipping that on its head and I'm going to give you the total score at the start and then we'll go through each category independently, uh, just so that we can sort of talk a little bit about why I've given this car the score that I've given it. So the total score for this uh, Creighton V4 is going to be 26 out of a potential 35, which equates to about 74.28%, which isn't too bad. But for those of you who have been following the channel for a while, you may remember that when I did my Creighton V2 review, I actually gave that car a perfect score. I was so impressed with what Armour had done from the V1 cars, which of course had a couple of little issues, uh, that I had a really good experience with the V2 car. I was so impressed with it that I felt that it deserved full marks. However, Armour have been improving these cars since then. Uh, of course, we had the V3. Now, the V3 I uh, did not do a review on, but spoiler alert, if I was to review that car today, which is actually sitting on the shelf just here, uh, I would also give that car a perfect score. Very, very impressed with that vehicle. Um, and of course, now you look at the V4 and think, well, hang on, how come we've taken a step back? Well, let's go through the categories and we'll talk about why that is. So category number one is the electrics or electronics. So this covers everything that is electrical in the vehicle, including, of course, the radio. Now, the motor speed controller and steering servo on these cars has been fantastic. Ever since uh, Armour upgraded these on the V2 cars, I've never had an issue with the speed controller, a motor, or even a steering servo. I know that some people out there will dispute that regarding the steering servos, but I based my, experience, my reviews on these vehicles uh, on the experience that I had with them, and I'm yet to experience any failures of these servos in the cars that I own. In fact, my Centen V1, which you can barely see out of shot, it's the black and the red short cross truck that you see there, that truck is still running the original steering server that it came with, and that's a V1, so that's about four or five years ago. Now, granted, I don't use that car every day, but I have used it plenty, and I'm yet to see that steering servo fail. There is no exception here. I've had no problems with these servos, and I'm going to uh, say that, yeah, the electrics here are perfectly fine. However, I've only given it a four out of five, and that really comes down to this radio. So the radio itself on paper looks fantastic. You have your standard reverse switches, you have your standard steering trims for both throttle and uh, steering. You have steering dual rate, which is a pretty good feature and found in a lot of ready to run radios. Not every radio has got it, but a lot of them have got it. Throttle dual rate's a bit of a unique one and, and one that you don't see on every ready to run radio. And then of course, you've also got a throttle limiter, which is uh, goes to 50%, 75% and 100%. Now that's a really cool feature to have uh, on a car like this, because if you're fairly new to the hobby and you pick this, pick this up as your first vehicle, well, it allows you to sort of cap the top speed of the car while still using some pretty powerful batteries and you're not gonna be slamming into things at 60 miles an hour wherever you drive this thing. So it allows you to get used to the power and you can slowly start turning that up uh, as you get used to the vehicle, fantastic. However, all of these cool features don't mean anything if when you hold the radio in the hand and you start to drive this car, there is a sense of disconnect. Um, and you also got the feel of the wheel and the feel of the throttle just don't quite marry up. And uh, I just felt that it didn't really deserve full, ma full marks. I, I really don't like these radios. I noticed it mostly when I was doing the speed runs for both the Creighton V4 and the Typhon V4. Um, and I pretty much immediately swapped out the radio on both cars. So if you're new to the hobby and you haven't really experienced too many other ready to run radios, you might actually get used to this and you might think that I'm being a little bit crazy. 
Uh, but if you've been in the hobby for a while and you've especially used the tactic radios that these cars used to come with, you will see a difference and most likely you will agree with what I'm saying. So uh, yeah, there's just something about these radios that don't quite match this type of vehicle. Uh, they feel very, very cheap. Um, you know, they don't feel like they belong uh, on a car that retails here in Australia for over $800. I feel that Spectrum can do a little bit better. I don't know what radio they could upgrade to. Maybe they need to design one from the ground up that is specific for these types of vehicles but I really don't think that the STX range or even the DX2 range, I think, um, would be a good fit for these cars. Uh, the fact that you don't have foam on the wheel, the fact that the throttle trigger feels a little bit off, and they're using, uh, especially on these radios, they're using the FHSS protocol. It's just, I don't know if it's the protocol or what the story is, but there's just a bit of a lag, there's a bit of, there's a bit of disconnect, something's not right. So I think a score for four out of five here is very fair. Uh, given the, the fact that, yeah, there's just a bit of a problem with the radio. Moving on to drivetrain. Now, drivetrain on these cars, for me, has been fantastic. I've not had an issue with any of these vehicles since, I think, the Outcast V1, where I stripped out a, uh, some teeth on the spur gear and I think the pinion as well. Uh, that's really the only problem I've had in recent time that I can remember where the drivetrains come into, uh, into light. Uh, every other vehicle that I've had, I've not had any diffs blown, I don't have leaky oils or on the diffs or anything dramatic like that. My drive shafts have been fine, my outdrive cups have been fine, bearings haven't exploded. You know, the drivetrain as a whole, for me, based on the experience that I have with these vehicles, has been fine. And for that, I have to give it a five out of five. Now moving on to handling, I'm actually gonna give this one a four out of five. And it's not because of anything that's on the car that's causing an issue. Again, we're gonna go back to the radio and I'm going to, again, highlight that sense of disconnect, that lag that we were talking about earlier. There's just something about this that just doesn't feel quite right. Um, whether I give handling on the car full marks or I give the radio electrics you know, a three out of five, it kind of makes no difference here, but I have to say that when you drive these vehicles with this radio, it affects the handling characteristics because of that lag, because of that sense of disconnect. Um, so I think that's fair. One point for the radio for just the cheap feel and the throttle and the steering. Another point for the fact that, you know, there's a little bit of a lag and yeah, the handling characteristics here just get affected in that regard. Now, as far as the car itself is concerned, Armour have been doing a fantastic job and they've even improved upon that uh, with this latest version. We have better tires, which are the Copperhead 2s. Now these are a bit of a throwback to the V1s, which had a very similar tread pattern. The suspension on these cars has been pretty good ever since the V2s. They improved it still on the V3s and they're you know, knocking it out of the park now with the V4s. I think the suspension on these uh, has been fantastic. Whoever is uh, you know tuning these cars up at Armour HQ, big thumbs up to you, sir or ma'am. Uh, you guys have been doing a great job. So uh, well done, keep it up. And I look forward to uh, you know future incarnations of not just this car, but also the other cars in the line because they've always been handling very, very well. And now we move on to durability. And this one's gonna take a little bit of a hit because I only gave durability a three out of five. And you might be wondering why did I only give this one a three out of five? I've only ran the car once. And unfortunately, I did have a major issue with this vehicle. Uh, but I was not the only one that, I, as far as I know, has had this problem. So to talk about durability, I'm gonna to have to rotate the car here. I'll take the body off very quickly. And I will show you underneath that I have a brand new chassis. So uh, this is a car that now sp sporting a brand new chassis after one run. You will also notice that I have aluminum chassis braces here holding everything together. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the original chassis over here. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how well the camera is gonna pick this up, but we have a kick up at the front, which is normal. Every one of these chassis have got this, but there's a kick down on the back here, as you can probably see. So uh, the issue that we have with this particular truck at the moment, and I'm gonna say this up front, I'm very good at listening to uh, the community feedback, whether it's uh, people like myself who review these vehicles, or it's just the average Joe that goes down to the hobby shop, buys the cars and then sends Armour an email, or shares their thoughts on the cars uh, via you know, uh, uh, the Armour forum or a Facebook group or whatever, you know, I have to applaud Armour for really keeping their ears to the ground and listening to all of these sort of 
feedbacks and comments and things that goes on there um, in the RC community when it comes to their trucks. The tower to tower brace that we see here is one example of them listening to the community because this is something that I know a lot of people have been doing for years. Um, even back in the uh, Thunder Tiger MT4 GT, uh, G3 days when that truck was the go-to truck for bashes, uh, which is now a little bit harder to get a hold of and you know the Creighton's kind of taken over. This is an idea that was implemented from way back then when I used to see people uh, putting tower to tower braces on those cars. So again, I applaud Arma for taking on these ideas, but I think that at some point there's been an oversight or they just simply didn't pick this up during their R&D testing, but there is a bit of a problem with the plastic chassis braces and this tower to tower brace being here and working together. Now I'm going to explain this as quickly as I possibly can and as well as I possibly can so that you can try and understand it. So first of all, these three millimeter aluminum chassis, all of my armor vehicles, my previous Cratons, my Sentons, my Typhons, Talions, all, you know, Outcasts, Notorious, all of these cars that I've owned in the past, they all end up with a little bit of a bend on the chassis, a bit of a curve, right? Um, the chassis ends up kind of sagging a little bit in the middle. And the reason for that is because, well, it's a three millimeter stamped aluminum chassis. Um, it's nothing really fancy. It's not the space grade aluminum. It's you know, these things are built to a price point and the chassis will do what the chassis will do based on how it's built, right? Now, we have in the middle here, we have a lot of weight. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't quite, have never really thought about uh, in the past because we have a motor that's quite heavy. You know, it's got magnets in it, it's got steel and aluminium bits and so forth. We got an ESC, which weighs a few grams as well. We've got a steering servo, we've got a receiver box and you have your battery tray. When you look at the car dry like this, you think, oh, it's not too bad that the aluminum chassis should handle that. But when you're putting big 6S batteries and 4S batteries in here that can weigh anything from, I don't know, 500 grams to a kilo, um, you know, you're putting a lot of weight in the center of these cars. Hence the reason why they have these, you know, plastic chassis braces and things like that. So when you're jumping these vehicles and you're landing hard on the ground, whether it's hard ground or soft ground, the center of the chassis is getting hammered with all of this weight and eventually it starts to sag a little bit. It's just, it's a normal thing that happens with these cars and regardless of brand, really, I'm sure that there's a lot of cars out there that will experience the same thing over time. But for me, it's not so much of an issue because it doesn't hinder the vehicle to the vehicle's performance. It doesn't stop it from doing what it normally does. It just ends up having a little bit of a curve. So now we have a tower to tower brace that's designed to stop the chassis from sagging. But with the plastic chassis braces and all of this weight in the center, my rear chassis brace broke right where the screw is because the weight kind of pushes down and then of course the chassis brace can't, doesn't allow to flex. It's not being allowed to flex because of the tower to tower brace so it pulls away from you know the chassis and that's where it snapped once that was snapped and i didn't realize that it was that it was broken until i got home um you know i kept running the car so obviously the chassis just kept getting hammered and eventually i noticed that it had a negative bend so rather not only does it have a little bit of a curvature also it also has this negative bend now and when you have this negative bend it's a bit of a problem you can pull it apart maybe straighten it back out but then you run the risk of having that, that particular section of aluminium being fatigued and it may create a bigger problem later on, which means you will eventually have to replace the chassis anyway. Um, and if you leave it as it is, well then you're kind of pulling away the outdrive cup on, on the rear, from the rear diff and you risk having the dog bone pop out in the back so you could lose your dog bone or you could damage it. So there's a, it's a little bit of a big deal, I think. It's not just a, a simple bent shock tower that you can hammer back into place. It's, you know, replacing this chassis, uh, which by the way, I did pay for myself. You know, it took a long time. It, it's, it's not a quick and easy fix. It's not something you can repair in 30 minutes. This, this took, I think, the best part of about an hour and a half or so um, to take everything off and put everything on the new chassis. So this is why I've given it a three out of five, because I think there were forces at play here Despite the fact that I think Armour have got their heart in the right place and they're trying to do everything they can to make these trucks as, as durable as they possibly can, I think that there is something here that needs to change. And I hope, I can only hope, that they've taken this as constructive criticism and they're going back and you know, instructed the mad scientists 
to come up with a solution. And I don't know what that solution is going to be, but hopefully they'll, they'll address it in future revisions of these cars and we won't have this problem. Now, if you want to get one of these cars or you've got one of these cars and you're worried about having this happen to you, there are a couple of solutions. Obviously, one of them being the aluminum chassis braces um, should hold on a, a lot stronger than the plastic ones. So that's an expense that you'll have to make a call on whether or not you want to do that. The other option, and my preferred option, especially for those of you out there who are on a bit of a budget, is to remove the tower to tower brace. Now, I know that a lot of people out there have actually been thinking about implementing this tower to tower brace on their previous cars, which you can do. These, a lot of these, uh, one of the cool things that Armour does and have been doing pretty much since the beginning is all of these little improvements that they do are generally backwards compatible. You can put them on your previous cars. So there's no issue there. So if you wanna do this on your existing Creighton, maybe you've already got the aluminum chassis braces and you wanna put this on, uh, great. You can go ahead and do that. You can buy the parts and get that installed. But if you've just bought the car and you're on a bit of a tight budget and you don't have the money to spend on the aluminum chassis braces, well then remove the tower to tower brace. Because I've, not, I've never experienced this negative bend on any of the previous cars that I've tested. It's only happened on this car. And that's why I'm putting the blame squarely on this little red rod here. It looks fantastic. As I said, their intentions are right. I think the outcome's a little bit different from what we've all ex we're all expected. Um, and that's something that I, I, like I said, I can only hope um, Armour are working on. And uh, yeah, we may, may see a solution in upcoming revisions of this vehicle. So that is it for durability. It gets a three out of five from me. So now we move on to maintenance. And maintenance is a category that I kind of created just regarding the initial setup of the car and also, of course, regarding maintaining the car. Because I've had cars in the past where it's actually really hard to access certain components like changing out a spur gear or accessing a diff. Or maybe I get a car out of the box and the shocks are leaking. I have to rebuild the shocks. Or oh, there's not enough oil in the diffs and I gotta rebuild them. So the initial setup of the car how easy or hard it is to access these components all play a part in the maintenance score. And it really comes down to the engineering of the car, the design of the car, the overall layout, I suppose. And for this one, I gave it a five out of five. No uh, surprises here. These cars have received five out of five from me in this category before, and it's no exception here. Now, I will point this out. I was going to deduct a point because of this tower. The tower brace is now blocking the center div from being removed and quickly accessed. Armour have improved the way that you can access that center diff without having to remove the entire motor mount. So you actually remove the diff from the top, but of course now you have to remove the chassis brace first before you can access it. So I was gonna take a point off for that. However, I also remembered that they improved the uh, motor mount and it is now a sliding motor mount. So rather than having to remove the entire center section of the car to change out a pinion and adjust your mesh, you can now do it just with two little screws on the top here and you can leave everything else intact. So you kind of give one to get the other and it kind of makes sense to leave this at a five out of five. Front uh, and rear diffs have been easily accessible from day one, no surprises there. They've improved things like the battery tray, you've got a bigger receiver box, so if you wanna change out your radios, you don't have to stress about getting a miniature little receiver to go in here. Um, this is something that's been going on, I think, since the V2s or V3s. So, actually, they changed the receiver box on the V3s. So, uh, yeah, these little improvements have been going on for quite some time. Uh, maintenance scores, yeah, stays at five out of five. And now we move on to part support. And for this one, I gave it a two out of five. Now, I'm basing this score purely based here in Australia. If you are in another part of the world and part support's really good there, well, obviously you're going to disagree with me here, but I can only judge this category on where I am and how easy or how hard it is to access parts. Once upon a time, I saw the globe as a big shopping center. If you can't find parts locally, no matter, punch the part number into Google, you should be able to find a bunch of places where you can get the part from, and hey presto, a week or two later, it's in the mailbox in your house and you're good to go. And that may still be the case today. However, the problem that we have today, at least here in Australia, is that the value of the dollar has dropped dramatically. So things are obviously a lot more expensive when you're buying stuff from the USA, for example. And we're also paying an import tax now. So it gets pricier again. So it's a little bit hard to really swallow some pills when you're trying to buy stuff from overseas 
because of these taxes and this uh, value of the dollar issue. So you, you really need to buy parts locally where they're a lot more reasonably priced. And this is where the problem lies. It's trying to get parts locally for armor in, in particular can be a little bit tricky. In some cases, you find parts quite quickly. In some others, especially with the newer models, it takes a long time to get parts into stores. And I myself know this because I work at a hobby shop. So it's a little bit tricky to really judge this one because I can see the parts category getting a little bit better. I can see uh, parts starting to come into the country more and more, but it just seems to be taking too long and it's too little at a time. We should be inundated with parts shortly after these cars have been released. And this is the other problem. The cars themselves are taking a long time to be released here in the country. I myself have been one of, the, I think of only two people that I know of that actually own one of these cars here in the country. Armour of course sent me this one out for review, but the, the customer of ours um, actually bought the exact same one, but they ended up buying it from overseas and they paid I think in excess of $1,000 for it. So, I mean, I might look at that and go, great, we're still making sales, but you know, retail stores like us are kind of struggling to support that, those customers that do that because we don't have the parts for these cars yet. Uh, the tower to tower braces don't exist, you know, the new servo mount and the new motor mount, all these sort of things, they, they don't exist yet. So it, it's a little bit hard to support a brand uh, with, with parts when they're not, they're not coming into the country and to, you know, to give it full marks just because it exists in other parts of the world, that would be wrong as well. So um, I think Horizon or the local distributor here need to lift their game a little bit. They need to really crank it up and, uh, and get those parts into the country as quickly as possible and also get the cars into the country as quickly as possible. Uh, because waiting, I think these uh, Cratons are not due here until August of this year, 2019. And they were released, I think, what, in uh, March, I think it was. Um, so we're talking, what, six months after the cars were released, that's when we're gonna start seeing them here in the country. That just seems a little bit ridiculous to me. Why so long? I mean, we have so much technology available to us today. The world is about this big. In you know, we, we can reach people all around the world. There's a bunch of different forms of telecommunications and, and shipping options and, and God knows what else. And yet we still have to wait six months for a, a product to be released here when it's released around the world everywhere else or most parts of the world six months earlier. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So hopefully they'll uh, address this in, uh, in you know, future releases. You know, I will say this though. I mean, I understand that, you know, armor have been taken over by Horizon. There's a bit of a transition period. There's a bit of testing the waters. There's a bit of adjusting that needs to be done by both companies. Um, I could understand that, but six months, really? I mean, yeah, I think that's fair. Two out of five, two out of five for uh, part support. I'm not gonna go any uh, higher than that. So closing out this review, we have value. Now for value, I have to say that sometimes I have to discuss this with a friend or two, get a different perspective, get a different angle, uh, because I always find it a little bit tricky to judge. Sometimes I might be too soft on it, sometimes I might be too hard on the product in question. Today, I'm actually gonna go with my heart, and even though I have discussed this with a, a couple of people, I'm gonna give this one a three out of five for value. And my justification here is simply because uh, we've had a couple of things happen with these vehicles. One, we've had a change of radio, which I feel isn't a perfect match for this car. I think either a new radio or perhaps changing the wheel and the tensions and all of these things uh, might improve uh, how these cars drive and how we interpret the drive with the cars, I guess, because of the feel of the radio. Because essentially this is what connects us to the car. If there's something wrong here, then that connection is, is going to be skewed it's it's not going to be right so it needs to be right um, and i guess that you know that's why people spend hundreds of dollars on aftermarket radios because they want it to be as perfect as they possibly can and um i, I don't think this is a this is the right way to go so one we've got a radio that i think a lot of people are going to be compelled to change uh, as opposed to the previous versions of these vehicles where a lot of people didn't really feel the need to change. They may have wanted to change, but it's not something that you go and use the radio and go, yuck, you know, this is not something that we want. Whilst now it kind of feels like, yeah, you, you might want to swap it out. And then of course, the other issue we've got is with the tower to tower brace um, causing the 
the rear chassis brace to break and then of course giving me a negative bend on the chassis so uh, some of it may be armor's fault some of it may not be armor's fault i don't know uh, but i can only hope that future versions of this vehicle you know we get some of these things corrected now of course we can't overlook the fact that these pro these cars have also gone up in price and i'm not going to really judge that too harshly because the truth of the matter is that armor continuously improve these cars and they've been doing so for a few years now and we never really saw a price hike up until now. So we've got better tires, we've got a better motor mount, we've got a better servo mount, we have the tower to tower brace, we have a stronger, more durable body than before. Uh, you know, we have all these little improvements that happen over time but we never see the prices come up and for me i think it is totally justifiable to have the price come up on this particular model however the reason why uh, again why we see only a three out of five for value is because of the radio and the tower to tower brace and the issues that it's causing so um i think that's very fair uh you know i have to weigh this up and i have to try and be as fair as i can with these vehicles uh, and i think a three out of five is, is pretty much where it sits for me so to recap we have a total of 26 out of a potential 35. We have a 74.28% out of a total of 100, which is just shy of seven and a half out of 10. Uh, and I think that's pretty much where I'll leave this one. Now, of course, if you enjoyed this review, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new. And as always, check out the video description for more information on the car, as well as links to my social media pages. I thank you all very much for watching, and I'll speak to you next time.